ideas with the whole society of the Greek and the Cypriot scientists. At this point, I uh, would like to introduce Professor Joseph Sifakis. Professor Sifakis is a Greek French computer scientist, laureate of the 2007 Turing Award, and he has been a full professor at Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne and the founder of the Verimark Laboratory. He will talk to us about a national innovation strategy, the vision and the implementation. Professor Sifakis, you can take on from here. Professor Sifakis, you are uh, muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, uh... Now you can hear me, I suppose. So it is a pleasure to talk about innovation and the perspective of the national innovation strategy in Greece. It has been clear for more than a decade that the way out of the crisis that the country is going through can only be achieved by the development of a modern and competitive economy driven by technology and innovation. Innovation has been declared a top priority in many programmatic statements of many governments. For years, the media and officials have been very optimistic about the possibility of Greece or one of its regions becoming a kind of Silicon Valley. Today, it is clear that uh, nothing concrete has been done in this direction and that the situation has not changed over the past 10 years. Innovation is just a buzzword in programmatic wish lists, and I doubt that decision makers realize that innovation driven development, what is a innovation driven uh, development. In this talk, I would like to discuss two issues explain under which historical conditions and processes innovation tend to be the engine for economic growth at the end of the 20th century, and second, how drawing on examples from other countries, we can develop a Greek strategy for sustainable development based on innovation. To start, I will say that in the 60s and 70s, there was little interaction between university research and industrial research. Large companies developed R&D in their own laboratories to cover their needs, from basic research to applied research and development. For instance, in the field of ICT, we have a famous industrial laboratories that have been the driving force behind the development of cutting edge technologies. These laboratories were uh, AT's, NT's, Bell Labs, Xerox Park, IBM Yorktown. These labs have brought together an impressive number of Nobel laureates and renowned engineers who have advanced the state of the art in this field. In the 80s, we observed a new situation resulting from the convergence between university research and corporate R&D. We are witnessing the emergence of innovation ecosystems that bring together three types of players, large companies, centers of excellence, and startups. Each of these players has a specific role. Industry brings funding and new problems. Centers of excellence provide basic research, skills and knowledge, and startups, of course, are lean structures capable of efficiently transforming the results of innovation into products and services. In addition, innovation ecosystems are characterized by a creative culture, human capital and quality of life. They are established in regions where it is good to live. Their development is supported by public subsidies and benefits from funding from private investors and the financial institutions and venture capital. Innovation ecosystems are based on a virtuous cycle that maintains and reinforces the symbiosis and collaboration between players. Centers of excellence obtain additional resources from industry and enrich the research portfolio at the same time. Industry avoids the risks and costs of basic exploratory research and focuses on applications and proof of concept. Let me emphasize that innovation ecosystems which originated in the United States are now a universal concept and collaboration scheme applied in all countries. 
The secret source of their success is the synergy between all the factors, including research, technology transfer, industry adoption, investment, and venture capital. An interesting observation about innovation is that you don't have to be an economic giant or a superpower to have a good position in the innovation arena. Ideas and creative manpower matter more than fear. We have innovation champions among the large countries, developed or developing, but also among small countries. Israel is now a famous case, and I think also it is an interesting case for Greece because of the many similarities between the two countries. Switzerland is a very innovative nation, judging from the number of IPs and patents they, they hold. Uh, Taiwan, of course, has achieved the global leadership in chip manufacturing, and the Scandinavian countries have a very effective model in place with a strong coupling between the research and technology uh, transfer. So these examples of small countries show that Greece's case is not hopeless. It makes sense to aim for an innovation-based economy if we take the right initiatives and measures. What are the measures to be taken? I would like first to stress the importance of human factor. This is something that is completely neglected by government policies and practices that are somehow reductionist and ignore human factors. The deficit of vision and ideas and of moral values cannot be compensated by material goods. We must restore meritocracy and belief in the common good, as well as support and recognition for creative initiative. I think we should radically reform the research system by working in two directions, critical mass and excellence. Why critical mass? The research landscape in Greece is very fragmented with universities, institutes, and other institutions. We need critical mass that focuses on certain strategic research areas. Today, breakthroughs in R&D require multidisciplinary knowledge and research supported by experimental evidence. They require a combination of skills ranging from basic research to applied research and development. From my own experience as the president of the National Research and Technology Council for the period 2014-16, there is a problem of relevance and lack of connection to the real economy. I think the available research potential should be restructured, for example, on a regional basis, for instance, to establish four regional centers of excellence with strong governance and focus. The other direction is excellence. We must change the criteria for recruitment, promotion, and evaluation to take into account the relevance and applicability of results. Workforce market is global. Research and academic careers should become more attractive. We cannot retain in the country high value researchers with poor salaries in a bureaucratic, rigid, and unfair system. Finally, I would like to emphasize the importance of openness and international collaboration. Taken to foster effective collaboration with the huge academic potential of the Greek diaspora, as has been done successfully in other countries, such as Israel and China. From a broader perspective, the government should consider R&D and innovation as top priorities, and we should strengthen technology and engineering at all levels of education. A Greek innovation strategy should have two components. First, identify the country's assets on which we can build an innovation-driven economy. And second, implement the necessary structural reforms. The development and implementation of this strategy cannot be achieved by issuing decrees, laws, and wishful thinking. 
It requires a well-planned and active collaboration of all factors for its realization. It also requires a dialogue and synthesis that would define a roadmap with priorities and milestones, specify the respective roles of the key players and orchestrate their action toward the common goals. With respect to industry, we should move away from inward looking state subsidized enterprises and promote the development of innovation driven enterprises capable of competing internationally. The government should take steps to promote incentives to develop R&D programs targeting sectors of national interest, such as defense and space, agriculture and food, shipbuilding and equipment. Finally, all these efforts need to be supported by investment. Despite dramatic decline in labor costs in Greece and the availability of highly skilled workforce, Greece is not attractive enough to foreign investors. Investors need guarantees that the laws of economy and that state will work. In conclusion, I think that we have so far wasted valuable time in long discussions and vain speculations about the future. We should stop pushing open doors and simply find the political will and the courage to undertake the necessary reforms and to move diligently and quickly toward the goal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sifakis, for this wonderful talk and insightful as well. Uh, at this point, we'll have a few minutes break before continuing with the sessions of the day. So thank you very much and stay tuned. Teresa, okay. we may thank have uh, one question. Ah, I didn't know about Professor this. Professor Sifakis, to... Uh, uh, Professor Kirisis uh, apologizes for the Ukraine uh, typo. Hey, uh, Professor Sifakis, can you please uh, answer this question? What will be the oh, impact? What, of the what will be what will be the, the impact of the current war in Ukraine? Oh, it's very, I mean, the impact of, on what? On what we want Globalization to do or... and the fourth industrial revolution as technology enable of this paradigm of multilateral collaboration. Will this affect oh, the it global? Is, it is, global... It is, uh, it, there, there is some risk here to stop somehow the, the globalization process. This is this is a risk, and uh, I would like that we avoid this, of course. Uh, so to see uh, the, the the key players uh, playing separately with their partners, and uh, this globally will not be good. But but it's it's very hard to to say what what can happen exactly. There is this risk to stop the this globalization process. Wonderful. If there are other questions, uh, I, I, I would uh, be delighted to, to, to answer. Thank you. 